I just took a bowl. This guy, this bowl has been sounding gnarly, nasty. On my right, there's two bulls fighting. I can see them going, their bodies moving back and forth between the trees. And then all of a sudden I hear this roar. There's another bull right there. I shot him. Did you hear that? No. Oh. We Dude. both just shot the same bull. I shot him first. He shot him first. <laughs> oh my gosh. What a heck of a pursuit, dude. All freaking day. <laughs> <laughs> When your buddy calls you, says you got a buck down. And what does he got? A buck down. Look what I found. Oh, what a sweet coos, man. Opening day, heck yeah. Way to go see. Arizona Archery Club is a premier partner with Bowhunting AZ. When it comes to attention to detail and a fiery passion, Arizona Archery Club brings it all to the table. With all the latest bows and archery equipment, you can demo every single model in person free of charge at their demo room. Walk through the process with an experienced bow tech and see which bow is right for you without the sales pressure. Their indoor archery range offers air-conditioned lanes with standard or 3D targets available. When you visit, be sure to mention you're a listener to the Bowhunting AZ podcast. Let's all support local. Conquering your own dark mountain is no easy task. The backcountry requires grit and determination. Having quality supplements like Dark Mountain's Kodiak pre-workout, whey proteins, and nourishing recovery are all an essential part of your success in the journey to harvest from the land. Dark Mountain is a 2% for conservation company because they know that with a collective effort, we can cherish these resources for a long time to come. Use promo code BOHUNTINGAZ20 for 20% off your order. Afflictor broadheads are cut into the core of broadhead technology. With both expandable hybrids and fixed broadheads, you have an arsenal available for any hunting need. Team Bowhunting AZ has placed our trust in Afflictor as our exclusive broadheads to hunt with. Check out Afflictor's selection over at afflictorbroadheads.com. Built Mountain Tough, Scree Gear offers hunters the highest quality clothing for affordable prices. With patterns designed by military concealment specialists, Scree Gear brings you closer to the game without being detected. With every climate in mind, Scree Gear hosts a huge selection of clothing for all the terrains of North America and beyond. Check out Scree Gear today at www.screegear.com. Use promo code BOHUNTINGAZ for 15% off your first order. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Bowhunting AZ podcast. Uh, I'm really pumped for this episode today because... Uh, this specific type of hunting has been pretty near and dear to my heart lately, and uh, it's something that I've really been uh, trying to pursue. It's something that's tough, but something that's really rewarding too. And I'm pumped to have someone on here that uh, is really renowned, very experienced, and uh, in my opinion, probably one of the top guys on on bears. So, Dylan, welcome to the podcast. Um, if everyone probably knows you as well as Dylan, but also by chasing the King on your Instagram handle and everything. So I just kind of want to let you take the reins here and introduce yourself and welcome to the podcast, man. I appreciate the intro, Steven, for having me on. Uh, that's a lot to live up to with that intro right there. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you'll live up to it, man. You definitely, you, all, anybody just needs to go scroll your feed and it, it definitely, definitely fills itself out for the story. So um, how long have you been kind of been guiding here in Arizona and how did you get into that? And tell us a little bit of the backstory there. I have been guiding. This will be my ninth season, I believe, um, here in Arizona. I've got to do a little bit in New Mexico as well and in Sonora, Mexico, but most of it's been here in Arizona. Um, it, it's been a kind of a lifelong dream of mine to, to guide. I got to actually go on my first big game hunt up in Kodiak, Alaska, and 
shoot a sick of black-tailed deer on Kodiak Island. And that's, that's kind of where the bear story begins a little bit for me too, but that's really where the, the guiding story begins too, because going to Alaska, it was a guided hunt. And that was, that was my first exposure to, to that at 11 years old. And I said that that was what I wanted to do. So I figured out a way to do that. And it's not very many people that can claim that what they said they were going to do at 11 years old for a career they actually stuck with and figured out how to do. And it hasn't been easy. I've learned a lot, been a lot of places. It, it's been a ton of fun, a ton of struggle. And uh, I, I'm going to keep doing this forever. Heck yeah, man. That's absolutely awesome. <clears throat> um, so we'll kind of jump into some of the, uh, kind of from a beginner's standpoint, because I'm fairly green myself and I'm only two years deep into bear hunting, you know, at somewhat avidly. And I know a few things of what to look for, but I also want to approach this as if I am like just a complete beginner, as if I'm brand new. Um, so if you got a guy that's its first year putting boots on the ground or something, where do you find bears and where do you start? Uh, a lot of people don't even, you know, really realize that, you know, bear is available as an over-the-counter tag in Arizona. And I mean, shoot, when I was a kid, I didn't even think bears were in Arizona. And, you know, here I am 33 years old and, you know, chasing bears and st starting to chase bears. And, and so kind of what, what do you look for and where do you really try and find them? Well, uh, as you know, we, we have plenty of bears here. Um, I think the reason that most people don't find bears and kill quality bears and and have bear encounters is they're they're simply not in the places that bears want to be. And the places that the bears want to be are generally away from people, you know, overlooked areas. Um, I think for the person that's going out and they're brand new to bear hunting, Arizona with its we have quality bears here we have old age class bears we've got lots of real estate that's bear country but we don't have ultra high densities compared to other parts of north america and for new people coming out and, and trying to get into it i don't think it's a hunt you go into and expect to fill a tag you know if, if you can find a target animal and take one every four or five years you've done really well in the Arizona bear hunting world. And you've, you've figured something out, some sort of consistency in an area <clears throat> or multiple areas. Um, it's it's just something you have to be prepared to fail a ton at. And most people don't like that. They want to go out. They want to glass up 20 deer in a day. And half the time they've got three days to hunt. They want to shoot one, take pictures, go home, chop up meat, put it in the freezer, and call it good until next year. It's not that kind of journey for bear hunting. It, it's a lot of exploring. It's a lot of trial and error. And if you're not good at, at reading the environment that you're in, if you're not good at you know, kind of being self-motivated and, and really just sampling an area, trying new spots, trying new techniques, doing lots of homework, um, it's something you're going to struggle with unless you get really lucky. And there's always those people. We know we know guys that get lucky. And trust me, I, I'll I'll take that over over the hard work sometimes. But <laughs> I think it's just something you you have to like sucking at it to like bear hunting in Arizona. Yeah, I remember when I saw my very first bear. We were actually Jake and I were scouting for our elk hunt. Um, we had two archery bull tags. And we were scouting, I think, oh, probably maybe late July, early August. And we were checking out this, uh, we were on flats, but we were near a pretty big canyon. And all of a sudden we looked in this canyon and just saw like two black spots moving up the side of the canyon. We're like, what in the world? And Jake was like, dude, I think that's a bear. And sure enough, you know, we break out our phone scopes and our binos and it's a mom and a cub. And I remember I was just like, I had never seen a bear in the wild in Arizona, let alone even thought there was many of them. And I was just like kind of awestruck at first. <laughs> I was like, whoa. 
and uh the, yeah just kind of set it from then on fo going forward it was like dang like i wonder if there's more like i wonder this must be where they like to be you know <laughs> there was water there and stuff so um, and that's probably how the majority of bear encounters occur in the state it's incidental the yeah. guys are out there elk hunting deer hunting whatever else and they happen to stumble into a spot particularly in the fall that has appropriate feed and all of a sudden there's a bear down 150 yards or across the canyon from them. They've never seen them before. It's always been interesting to me the people you run into and talk to when you're out in the woods and every year I have a conversation with guys and they're like, yeah, I've been out here, I've hunted Arizona all my life. I've been out here 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. I've never seen a bear. What are you guys out here doing? What are you out hunting? It's like, oh, we're bear hunting. <laughs> there's bears out here? It's like, yeah, yeah, there is. And they're there if you know where to look for them. Yeah. And they don't want to be found. Yep. Yeah, they're definitely definitely one of the most elusive for sure. Like those and mountain lions are for sure the seem to be the most elusive. Um Right. Good luck finding a mountain lion on purpose without dogs. <laughs> yeah, no. And we uh, shoot, I even we just had our first encounter uh when was that? I think a little bit before December, I drew a population management elk tag and my buddy and I were walking on a mountain and all of a sudden I heard him like snapping his fingers at me trying to get my attention. And I look at him and he's pointing and he goes, lion, 30 yards and points. And I look and there's this lion just standing there and we're like, uh, <laughs> like, and that was, that's pretty much how I've seen most of them it, either hiking up on them or driving up on them. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And it was just wild. I mean, you know we all know they're out there but just to finally like have confirmation of it is just something different um what type of terrain specifically should we look for when it comes to bear hunting i mean you know if you got a guy that's just going to throw a dart at the board and try and say okay am i looking for grasslands am i looking for pine am i looking for you know that juniper country that we know in arizona or like what specifically do we want to try and see because we know that bears are over a large portion of the state it's just what do we need to specifically kind of seek out so we've got two varieties of, of bear in the lower 48 brown bears and black bears brown bears everybody else call, if they're interior they're often called grizzly bears those are your open country bears and they'll be in grassland type habitat that's pretty uncommon for black bears continent wide for them to be out in the, in the open unless there's a food source that draws them out. They like cover, they like timber, they like to rush. Pretty much, if you're anywhere above 4,000 feet in elevation in the state, you're in bear country. And it tends to be very thick, very remote, very rugged, very steep, which Obviously, there's a lot of the state that meets that criteria. <laughs> you know, that, that question to, to just throw a dart at the board and, and see where it lands and, and if it's a good bear spot. It may be a good bear spot, but when is a good bear spot? And it might have been a year ago, and there might not be any real concentration in there this year or for five years. Um they move around, they have big ranges, and just because quality bear habitat doesn't even mean that there's bear in it right now when you go look for one. I don't know, certain times of the year, that's a different story. Um, I think you really have to have a better understanding of, of what's going on in the landscape. You can certainly go out and treat it like you do any other species and walk out to the edge of the canyon or up on a glass and knob and tear apart country with optics and you'll probably see bears. Uh, might not be bears that you can get to, particularly if you've got a big view over a big gnarly canyon, uh, some places that they live are just not feasible to get into and actually shoot one and get out and still be alive at the end of the ordeal. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's that's the biggest reason why people aren't killing more bears and killing bears regularly. The majority of living places that people shouldn't go and don't want to go for good reason. 
it's it's steep, nasty country, and it it doesn't care who you are, why you're there, or what you're doing. You've got to be ultra prepared going into it. And when you see bears in easy areas, you know, count that as a fluke because it's not the norm for bear country and bear behavior. I'd prefer if they all uh, were in nice, easy locations to get to. It would, it would certainly be a lot easier to actually make them dead, but that's part of the fun of it. Can you, can you actually go in and locate something in some hellhole and come back home at the end of the day? It, it's, a, I think, the hardest species to find, uh, aside from lions, and the hardest species to judge, the hardest species to kill, and the hardest to pull off safely. Uh, I really think the only thing that compares to it is they don't want to be where people are at. Um, if I was brand new going out to pick a spot, I would start where most people do. Start where I did. Look at the regs and see where a unit's open for the time frame that you have off. And get out and just cover country with the expectation that you're probably not going to see a bear. But you go out, you look for sign, you look for feed, you look for tracks, look for water sources, and tear apart the whole landscape and figure out, you know, if you were an animal that didn't like people and didn't like pressure and was very hungry all the time, uh, where would you be at in that landscape? You kind of just have to go do a lot of exploring and I'm not sure if that's real helpful for most people. A lot of people don't know how to explore. They go to the same spots that they've gone for 35 years hunting, and that's why they don't see bears. Yep. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, man. I I noticed a lot of our kind of discoveries in terms of bear country was really like one of our habitual practices is to go walk the edge of water holes. And I remember like, as we started picking apart some of these different units and stuff, walking the edges of this water and just being like, you know, Oh, you know, elk, elk, deer, deer, you're looking at different prints in the mud. And all of a sudden we'd be like, Oh, like bear. Okay. You know? And we're like, huh? All right. And then we'd kind of look at the landscape around it and be like, yeah, you know what? That really makes sense. There's a big drop off in a Canyon over here. Okay. Now I understand. Right. So that really. And so when you would go out and walk those tanks, like you'd probably look at what ten or fifteen of them, not see a bear track, and then you get in the spot and you find a bear trap. Yep. You know, it's it's not quite as straightforward. You can't just say, you know, this is an elk mountain, and go. You could probably go find elk on it just by looking at the top of the map and having a little bit of common sense. Yeah. It's not necessarily the case with bears. You might go to that tank and see a track. Next year, you might come back and walk that same tank while you're out there looking for archery deer or whatever else, and there's nothing on it. Right. You've just got to go sample a large area. Yep. Yep. Um, what does kind of each season yield in terms of activity? Because, I mean, a, a spring bear hunt is noticeably different than a fall bear hunt. Can you kind of break those down for us and explain it? Yeah, for sure. Um Anytime from basically November through March, you're going to have really minimal bear activity. Uh, that's their, you know, dinning type season. By by mid November, most bears are pretty inactive. Uh, anybody that's spent any time in, in Arizona knows that you know there's feed and sometimes mild weather all throughout winters. Bears here aren't denning because snow is driving them into a den or something like that. Females are obligate dinners because they're going to have their cubs in January. Um, but all bears are still going to have a reduced metabolic state in the winter months. And their their range is going to shrink significantly. doesn't mean they're not active. They're just harder to find if you're not looking at a very specific location. And you're far less likely during those colder months to pick up multiple bears, you know, cruising and out feeding and stuff. They might get out of a den site and go to a water source, feed a bit, but 
such a range is maybe one one thousandth of the size that it is in the summer months. Starting from March, March April period, activity starts to increase dramatically with that spring growth, and that's really just a, a continent wide phenomena with bears. Like as the spring growth occurs, their metabolism start to increase. They come out, they start eating grasses. You get the spring progression of growth. Their feed sources gradually change throughout the summer. You start getting into that late May, June period. You start getting into the breeding season on bears, which I've actually seen bears in breeding behavior from any point in about mid-April all the way into early August. It's a huge window. Wow. But the, the feed progression goes through the summer. You, you know, you watch the landscape, you watch plants grow. They've got to go through their new growth cycle, their flowering, their fruit set, and then the ripening of whatever that crop is. And those that peak time period is, you know, August through late October at various elevations. You've got hundreds of different food sources that are of the most significance to bears. So that, that late summer, early fall period, black bears go into hyperphagia. And what that basically means is they're consuming all the calories that they possibly can with the least amount of effort to put on fat and get through that winter time period when that's obviously the lean time throughout the year. Um, to go out on a, a spring hunt, which going forward, all of our spring hunts are, are just going to be limited to March, April. If you find a single bear on a spring hunt, you, you did good from a recon standpoint. If you find evidence on a bear, you did good. Um, don't expect much activity on those type of hunts. Uh, they just don't move around much that time of year. Uh, on an August type hunt, October hunt, which about well, 45% of the bears are killed in October alone. It's got a lot more units open that time of year as well. Um, if you're in the right kind of area, you're going to have multiple bears and multiple bear encounters. And you get the opportunity to you know, actually observe and compare a lot and be more selective during those times of the year. I dislike kind of the the spring hunt here in the sense that it is because it is more difficult to find bears get a lot of guys to go out and bear hunt very excited shoot the first bear to see obviously that's the case during any season in arizona it's far more important to be super super selective on spring hunts when they have little tiny cubs Mm -hmm. but we've sat and watched bears in March and April that have cubs that are, you know, the size of a teacup Yorkie. And we didn't see them until six hours later after watching them. And the mature sow wandered off and fed a bit, bathed in the sun walked back to his spot and hung out, hung out, say, in a corridor on a shelf for a long period of time and wasn't for a significant amount of time until these two little fur balls come bouncing out. And if you get ahead of yourself in that season, when cubs aren't inactive, it would be really, really easy for someone to make a mistake that time of year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are a couple, like, identifying factors on that note? Because... I, I don't, I think there, I, th I believe there's some sort of resource out there that does talk about it, but what can a newbie look for specifically to tell the difference between like a boar and a sow? Well, you can't be having a good view of the rear end of a bear and actually ID in the parts that one has and the other doesn't. <laughs> you know, obviously, obviously that part's pretty straightforward. Um, but if a bear's got a long thick coat on it, that, in and of itself and the terrain they live in it can be hard to have that view on a bear I, the most reliable thing well let me back up if you look at a lot of bears spend a lot of time around bears i don't care how much you've done it 
you can't get it, you can't get it wrong from time to time. Mm-hmm. And because there's a lot of difference in kind of the morphology of, of bears, they don't all look the same. It's kind of like people, you know. Some dudes aren't going to be more than five eight. They just won't. Doesn't matter how old they are. <laughs> they aren't going to grow <laughs> past that size. And some dudes are going to be seven foot tall. There's the same sort of difference in bears. Some of them are going to have a big old pot belly, and some of them are going to be look like a you know a lean jogger out there on the hill. <laughs> uh, ton of variability. You you can't directly compare a bear to a bear, it, even in the same age class, same location. Um, it's not some sort of exact science. I think the best indicator is simply having time to watch an animal. Mm. If you want to be positive about the sex of the animal or have some sort of relative certainty in it, you need to watch that animal for a long time and watch its behavior. You know, those, those older mature boars, they, they have a kind of a cocky attitude to them. And to me, they walk around like a, football player walking out on the field and they're in the best location for that time of year and their mannerisms as they're as you're watching them in the glass move around feet on a hillside interact with other bears is just that of a bear that i mean it it acts like it owns the place there's nothing to fear out there you, know, you see a smaller bear come in and they're they're fidgety. You watch them check the wind numerous times. Bird flies in, they're looking at it and super wired almost like a deer would be, you know. As a deer gets older they kinda of get more spooky and hard to find. As a bear gets older, they get more arrogant and aren't really worried about anything going on around them other than what tastes the best and is right in front of their nose. <laughs> um, and I think other than the sex organs on a bear, if you can see them, um, the most reliable thing just from a visual standpoint outside of behavior is, is looking at the front end on that bear. Most of the time I disregard what the head looks like because there's so much variability in that. I, I want to see a good profile view of the front legs, the shoulders on that bear, watch it move around, get different angles. Boars, mature boars are going to have you know, more defined musculature on their shoulders. They're going to have much longer and much more muscle in their entire front arm. And typically, if you can see the area on the bear from the elbow down to the paw, you can be, I don't know, 90% certain what that bear is. On a boar, if you were looking at the elbow and you, you had a profile view of that front leg, if the outside edges of that leg were perfectly parallel all the way down to the paw, so the elbow, forearm, wrist, paw are all the same width, it's almost always a boar. If you look at a sow and you have a really wide elbow and those outside lines taper down, kind of making a really elongated trapezoid towards the wrist, can get narrow towards the wrist. Female bears, I don't care how old they are, they always have smaller paws than boars, front paws, and they always have narrow wrists. And whether you're looking at a two-year-old bear or a 15-year-old bear, the leg difference, the front leg difference seems to be the best indicator just from, from a physical standpoint. Definitely number one, though, you said is patience, just being patient with the bear and just making sure patience you take... and watching behavior, yeah. Yeah. It, it, boars are going to have an attitude out there. Okay. I remember it's specifically... It's different than a sow is. Okay. I remember specifically an encounter that I had of a, a, a bear that walked up to the edge of the canyon 
and um, we were calling, and that's kind of my next question, which I'll segue into, but we were calling, and I remember the way that the bear presented himself. It was, like, undeniable. He was, like, he just, like you said, just had that cocky attitude, and you knew he was, like, king of that area. <laughs> and it was it was interesting behavior to see from an animal because, you know, I'm used to hunting deer and stuff. And, yeah, you kind of see some of that behavior during the rut, but it's not, like, you know, totally common all the time with deer to see something like that, to have that kind of an attitude. Um, so it was interesting. I feel like when you're close on smaller bears, younger bears, and they see you, it is, it is kind of similar to seeing a deer. Like they look at you, the deer in the headlights look and run off, get spooky. But you see that older bear and you're close enough to see their eyeballs without optics. They look at you like they're looking through you. <laughs> in a way that's completely different than an elk looks at you or a deer looks at you. Yeah. Yep. Um, so into that segue of the calling, when is a proper time to predator call? And that's always a tactic that can be used. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Um, I personally don't know how much you do it, if at all, but when, <laughs> when would be the right time to do it and when, when wouldn't be the right time to do it? Well... My opinion on calling is that I only do it when I cannot find bears by every other tool I have available. Okay. Which for me is covering lots of ground, finding feed, using optics. I would rather find a bear that I haven't manipulated its behavior in any way because in those scenarios, then I have the time to be more patient and observe those behavioral cues i kind of dislike calling because if a bear comes in i mean sometimes they'll stroll in sometimes they'll come roll, rolling in full speed like a coyote mm. you know, in thick timber and they're not going to hang out when you call them in and you've got a split second to make a positive id on whether that bear's the appropriate bear to shoot or not mm. Dude, that's some killer where, insight. Where it could be of a major advantage is if you found a bear in a location that you physically couldn't get to and you attempted to make a call to manipulate that bear into a better location to be able to shoot it or recover it. Um, for the most part, I'd rather just come back and shoot that bear later and never let it know I was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then you're not uh, giving it education not, as well. Not that it doesn't work. I know people have done it. I've seen plenty of videos, I'm sure, of you, of, of people manipulating bears like that and moving them closer to shoot them. I just don't like that technique myself because I'd rather them not know that I was there at all. Mm -hmm. um, the only time, and, and I have, I don't call bears that I can see. I have blind called for bears um, with not much success. I've done a lot of stands, you know, 45 minute, hour and a half stands, um, fawn in stress, jackrabbit in stress, um, bear cub in stress type thing. Um, for me personally, for whatever reason, I haven't had a lot of luck calling in bears blind. Um, I have done it. Had a bear come running in full speed to like 15 feet. Super exciting. Um, it was, I only used that option when the circumstances made it our only option to have a bear encounter. Mm -hmm. um, and then you see guys out turkey hunting. I, I've called in bears and had bears follow me elk hunting using elk calls. <laughs> and just went around behind me. Uh, it's not uncommon for turkey hunters to call in and things like that. They certainly can be called. Um, the consideration on calling, I guess, is you're, you're never going to beat a bear's nose. If you've got the wind wrong and you're actually specifically going out there to try to call a bear, if it can smell you, it knows what you are, even if you sound like something else. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And that, dude, that's why I love picking people's brains like yours, because having specific insight like that is like one you know somebody newer might not take into consideration of like one are we educating the bear 
two, what are some of the repercussions of calling in the bear? Like, you know, uh, it's going to come in hot and then I'm going to make a split decision and just get excited and see a bear and shoot it right away without identifying whether or not there's cubs around or anything else. So yeah, it's great, great insight to think about, you know, what are some of the repercussions or what are, what are other approaches I could take when coming to that situation of, should I call or should I not call? Right. It, it, it absolutely can work. It, it's just not a technique that I have like to utilize. You know, like I said, it, every time I've used it, it's it's been a last resort type of thing. Mm-hmm. That, that was the only way we we're going to have a bear encounter because the circumstances dictated it. Gotcha. Um, but I'd rather try everything else to just see that bear and, and be able to get a good look at it and what it's doing. You know, totally uninterrupted. Yep. And I learn more, even if we're not going to shoot the bear in that scenario too. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you call it in, you're going to get better at calling them in. That's true. Are you going to get better at judging them and making correct sex ID calls and things like that when they come running in every time? I don't know. I haven't done that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I do when I get to glass them up and watch them because we're watching 20 times more bears than we're shooting. So we're getting that whole library of bear behavior. You know, why is a bear in this location at this time type of deal? Uh, I get to catalog that every time when right. I find bears in that method. Right. Well, because if you're calling, you're manipulating the encounter pretty much, right? I mean, you're changing the, the way that the encounter happens. And like you said, you're not able to library all those behaviors. Right. Yeah. You can, you can probably duplicate it and call more bears in, which, <laughs> which definitely would be handy at times. Right. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's transition. So once like we've got that bear spotted and let's kind of do two scenarios. What's, what's the best approach for a bear once it's spotted? So let's say we've got one grazing, you know, uh, prickly pear fruits on a steep canyon and then let's say a different scenario where it's open grassland and it's just grazing through a piney forest um you've already kind of touched on you know the wind and you can't beat their nose is there any other factors that we need to take into consideration when making an approach well uh, yeah i would say most of it's environmental um depends on how far you are away from that bear how much daylight you have prepared you are to go into that spot uh, there's a lot of scenarios where we'll just sit and watch a bear see what it does come back in the morning where we're better prepared to go into a spot like that and try to relocate the thing it's if you go into it and you're not prepared it's a recipe for disaster particularly on those early hunts you describe in a, a perky pair scenario you know it's probably going to be on an august hunt maybe early october in very limited locations with what's open with that type of terrain that time of year. Um, you know, say that bears 500 yards across the canyon, but you can't get across the canyon until 11 o'clock at night. You know, can you do that safely? Can you get that bear out in the dark safely? And if it's a bear that's large, you know, I think might fill up three to five backpacks. Mm. I'd be able to do that multiple times and have the resources or help. Um, I guess the scenario doesn't give enough details to say, well, you do this. Uh, I've never had a bear scenario that was the same. They're all different. You get to make a judgment call for every scenario. What's best? what's safest, what are you prepared for, what you qualify to do. And you just, you need to know what your limits are. Um, contrast it with your bear scenario of a, a one walking through the grass and in the timber. Um, I would expect to, what, I, what I'm picturing by that scenario is like a literal flat in, in the timber and just a bear strolling through like you're walking back to camp and just stumble into this thing on a, on a slight rise in front of you. Um, 
it's probably not there because it's on some sort of food source. It's moving from point A to point B if you're bumping into a bear in that scenario. And it's probably not something you're going to see there again unless there is a food source. If a bear's feeding somewhere, you can find that bear in that general area again. If it's just traveling through an area, you don't know where it's going. Mm. It might go 300 yards to the edge of the canyon like you described with the tracks on the water hole. Or it might be walking across a five-mile flat section of pine trees to the next mountain range and not be back for four months. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, do you have enough time, light, and to evaluate that animal and take a proper shot? It's less risky in that scenario on flat ground, getting it out, getting it back, most likely. Mm-hmm. Um, what types of calibers are really generally best for bear. I mean, I get, I understand there's some that, you know, people, anytime you talk about calibers, man, you you get a rise out of anybody and everybody on what works and what doesn't, but what are some go to, uh, well-known bear rounds that you would, you've seen tried and true? Well, there's no such thing as too much dead. (laughs) For me, uh, Whatever someone is most competent with, I don't care if you shoot it with twenty five out six or three thirty eight run. If you don't shoot that gun well, I don't want you to use it mm-hmm. for a muzzle, muzzle loader or anything. Um, most of our scenarios, just like all of our hunting here in Arizona, we've got relatively open country. We're making far shots, having faster and heavier bullets. That's going to increase your range. It's going to increase the possibilities that you're successful. Not to say that you can't kill them with anything else. Um, I've shot a bear with a pistol. I've shot a bear with a bow. I've shot bears with various calibers from you know, uh, 25 out 6, 7 mag, uh, 300 wind mag, uh, 300 rum. Uh, they all work. Whatever you're shooting, I. I Really dislike the Hornady long range bullets, the ELD stuff. Uh, regardless of species, I've seen a lot of animals walk away after taking multiple bullets from those, um, regardless of caliber, particularly when shooting stuff that's close range with those bullets because they're designed to perform at long distances and open up under lower velocities. If you hit bone, you're screwed with those bolts. Mm. You're not going to get good penetration. No. Uh, we've had bears that were shot at under 150 yards, under 75 yards, and got up and started walking away after taking those ELD bullets because uh, they didn't get any penetration. Wow. Uh, you get 100% energy dissipation into the target with them because the bullets don't go through, and internally it looks like you hit them with a truck but that's not really what i'm trying to do with most bullets i would rather punch drain holes and be able to find stuff and have it die relatively quickly not from blunt force trauma mm. if it's up close <laughs> <laughs> um, i actually really like regardless of caliber uh the barnes ttsx bullets the all copper bullets uh, but those bullets i want them going really fast with larger calibers, faster calibers, you and have your bullets, you've still got some moderate and long range capabilities out of those guns or those bullets, I mean. And what I like about them the most is you can punch through bone so and not have much deflection on that bullet. You can get full pass throughs. Okay. Uh, you can take high shoulder shots. You can anchor animals and you can not blow big gaping holes in capes or have tons of meat loss with them. Mm. You know, you, you can run that bullet down its spine or through both shoulder blades and anchor an animal on the hillside and go through both lungs and have it be a quick, clean, efficient kill and have low risk of losing that animal. Or if you're not shooting all copper stuff, you know, having just a quality bonded bullet, AccuBombs, uh, 
liked the Shiraku 2 performance, a lot of animals. Um, it, it just depends on what your gun likes, what shoots most accurately. Mm-hmm. Obviously, use that first. No, don't, don't go switching to a different performance bullet if it doesn't shoot good out of your gun. But the more energy you can put on target, you need to you need to treat bears like their elk or moose or you know they're technically dangerous game to some extent, and they're they're large tough animals. They will soak up bullets, especially put in the wrong location. Mm. The, the only two things in Arizona that would compare to them with their ability to eat bullets or elk and buffalo. That's crazy. Yeah, and I've heard a lot of people say too that that their fur they don't always necessarily bleed real well because their fur soaks up a lot of the blood. Is that have you found that to be true? Um, well, that depends on where you shoot them. Okay. <laughs> Significantly. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I I would say that you don't get blood in in the same way you do other species. Right. They actually, the times that we see the, the best blood are on, on obviously low hits. You put a drain in the bottom, it bleeds better than the top. Uh, and marginal hits or, or wounded bears, if someone clips a leg, forearm, they often survive. Uh, super tough animals. Mm-hmm. But we often find more blood in those scenarios because they're moving you know, the limb around, rubbing it on stuff, rubbing against brush. Ah. It's, it's definitely different than other species, but they do bleed like anything else. You poke a hole in them, they're going to bleed. Sure, sure. Um, if you poke a good hole in them, you don't have to follow them, though. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what are some good tips and strategies on spot and stock specifically for like archery hunts for bears? Um, obviously that's going to change up quite a bit, probably I'm assuming from your standard rifle hunts that you're doing where you've got, you know, at at least nowadays, 600, you know, yard range and more sometimes. So what does it look like when you're okay? You know, we're going to do our uh, archery whether it's spot and stock or I guess even, even for blinds, because you probably set a fair bit of water too, I'm assuming. Um, not a ton. Okay. It's, it's a pretty limited technique. Uh, the, the majority of, of what I do is, is glassing. Gotcha. Uh, glassing trout corridors, glassing food sources, uh, glassing near water, which all of those things can mean a lot of different things, even in a small area. Um, if you want to come out and spot and stock bears with a bow, uh, get really used to walking around in the mountains and scaring everything away and not seeing bears. <laughs> um, very few people do it. Uh, you know, killing a bear in general in Arizona is mm. super difficult. Uh, Roughly, just based on the amount of tags that are sold and the amount of average amount of bears that are killed annually, it's about a five percent success rate hunt. Wow! Uh, you switch that over, break that into you know, weapon type and technique type. Uh, the majority of guys killing bears with bows are doing that with dogs. Mm, okay. The only way to reliably get close, and then you're going to have a portion of, of people that are killing bears incidentally, particularly on the August hunt when you know, OTC, turkey, lion, bear, deer all open and shit in the water hill and bear comes in, season's open to shoot with a bow. Uh, I'd say this is speculative because I don't actually have the breakdown of the data for that, but probably more of them killed incidentally like that deer hunting sit in the water than actually a true spot and stock scenario gotcha um for it to work properly with a bow you need feed conditions to be absolutely perfect that a bear is going to stay put for a long enough time for you to get from where you observed it to a shooting position which bear country is not very flat and that may mean an hour drive around and a three hour hike into a spot to get into that location. Mm. If a bear's not occupied for that amount of time, 
you can forget it. It's going to be somewhere else by the time you get there, yeah. especially if you don't have somebody watching the thing. Um, I actually enjoy making them dead because <laughs> that, it's a lot of work just to do that in general. So <laughs> I haven't tried to do too much archery spot and stock stuff. Uh, you know, the, the scenarios that you, you see at work are you can observe a bear make the call that it's a good bear and manipulate it in with the call to come in closer or, you know, it's occupied on some sort of food source that's actually in a open observable place where it doesn't matter if that bear moves 1500 yards up and down that corridor or on that mountain face, you can have eyes on it the whole time. Mm. You know, if, if it shows up on a small prickly pear patch that's surrounded by brush, odds are you're not getting close to it before that thing leaps. Uh, just like any better hunting, expect to fail a whole bunch and wait for the right opportunity on the right bear. And it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of trial and error to have that opportunity with a bow, spot and stock style. It's mm-hmm. not impossible. It happens every year. And there's been some awesome bears killed in that manner. But that's, I'd say, probably the, the most advanced thing to do in all of the, the spot stock segment of bear hunting. That's crazy. That's crazy. Um, you post a handful of recipes on your social media and your website. Uh, what are like some common misconceptions about bear meat and what are some of the great uses that you found for it? Well, the common misconception is that it's not edible. You know, I, how many comments do you see and everybody else see online when somebody shoots bear and they're like, why would you shoot that? You're not even going to eat it. It's like, <laughs> who, who said I wasn't going to eat it? Um, I have not eaten bears from other places. I have eaten lots of Arizona bears. Um, killed in just about every month that there's been a season here. And I've yet to have one that tasted bad. Uh, if you think bear meat tastes bad particularly if it's killed in the Southwest. Uh, it's just that you don't know how to cook. Mm. I think of all of the big game species in the state, the flavor profile of bear is the closest to beef. From a prep standpoint, you need to treat it like pork because of risk of parasites and trichinosis, but, most people know about it if you're familiar with bear hunting whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to cook it well done. So it's it's lots of slow cooking stuff. It's lots of grind. It's great for making sausages. Um, in recent years, I rarely will bone out the, the forearms or the shanks. I'll just cut them into two or three pieces, bone in. Uh, as you know, breaking down an animal, like lots of tendons in there. And and by the time you try to get all that separated out and have meat to throw in your grind pile, you, you've thrown a lot of stuff away. Uh, the most efficient thing is just to cross cut it and treat it like a roast. Mm. Uh, brown it, slow cook it. Um, and I think don't listen to any of the time requirements on recipes for what it takes to break down any game meat let alone bear meat. Uh, you know, if it says eight hours on a recipe, you're cooking it all night. <laughs> uh, eight hours, it might be the consistency of good you're tired, depending on the cut of meat, or on a lot of animals, it could be that way. Uh, it's patience when you're cooking it, too. Uh, low and slow and flavorful recipes. Uh, we save... In any scenario that a bear has fat on it, and we can reasonably pack it out, um, we take everything we can. It, will, it doesn't have to be super clean. If, if, if it's muddy, I won't use any of that kind of fat, but like small bits of, you know, say uh, leaf litter or pine needles or green grass and something like you could pick a lot of that stuff out i'm not worried about fat being super clean but cube it up and render it melts just like you're cooking bacon and you get a you know skillet full of bacon grease 
it's almost the same consistency as it. We just strain it through paper towels and into jars and put it in the freezer, and it's got a shelf life of forever. Huh. Um, we'll use the shanks or some of the other roast cuts that we will save like out of the front shoulders and slow cook them. Just do a simple barbacoa recipe. You know, start it lunchtime the day before and the next evening the, the meat's ready to to go completely shreddable and we'll use that bear lard to we'll make masa and make bear tamales mm. that's probably our favorite thing is to make oh, tamales man. with the, the bear lard and bear meat oh, that sounds so good <laughs> um i i'm a very picky game meat eater uh, I don't like anything with off smells to it. I don't like anything with uh, you know, quote unquote, gamey flavor, whatever that means, because that means a lot of things for different animals. <laughs> um, but one thing I found is, regardless of species, if it's something I'm going to slow cook, sometimes it, it that'll like amplify the flavors of it, especially if it's a cut of meat that has connective tissue on it, or any sort of fat on it, or tendons, anything like that, that are, they're going to break down throughout that process and it's going to be sitting in that liquid often you'll get the weird you know minerally metallic smells out of some out of elk out of deer out of bear roast slow cooking what i found is just salt and pepper uh using something acidic like tomatoes and stock and doing the initial cook until the meat's almost to the point where you can shred it and then i will dump that liquid off and pick out any of the inedible stuff that's, you know, say on the edge of the piece of meat, it's easy to pull out at that point. And then I'll start over. Uh, if it was a really gamey piece of meat, I would you know, actually rinse it at that point, start over with fresh liquid, fresh spices and everything. And whether it's been doing javelina shanks or bear roast or elk, neck meat doing that to it i've been able to cook dang near any cut of meat and have it be 100 percent palatable at the end of it Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely dude that's phenomenal advice especially for on some of the uses and i know i i haven't mastered the crock pot i don't know why i haven't been able to get it to work out yet but i just i don't know if i need to give it more time or what man but i just all my roasts they just plump up and they get tough and so I've stopped stopped trying on roasts. <laughs> You're about halfway there. That okay. Point. A lot more time. Uh, make sure you brown your meat appropriately and just a lot of time. Um, we'll save bones, make stock. We'll any of we've done osbuco with shanks. Um, that that's kind of become real popular with all the game cooking stuff. There's lots of recipes for that. Um, Again, the, the time things, uh, I don't agree with on any of the recipes. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. usually two or three times the amount of time, so they're like, don't. I mean, you might be able to start it in the morning and have it for dinner, uh, but don't start it at 2 o'clock and think you're having it that night for a meal if it's a <laughs> slow cut, cut of meat. Yep. It's tomorrow's dinner. Yep. Yeah, I've got a couple buffalo briskets that I did save. I just wanted to kind of revisit it and see and uh exactly like what you said my my dad threw out the same idea and he's like have you tried putting tomatoes in with it just to get that acid in there and break it down some and i was like oh no i I should do that and he's got a huge crop of tomatoes right now so it'd probably be the perfect time to revisit that and just let it sit overnight and and go for the next day um so let's transition into guiding a little bit so you said this is your ninth season guiding and the initial kind of um like the uh what's the word i'm looking for (laughs) the spark that kind of started it all was was an alaska visit um but guiding here specifically in arizona what are a few things that like potential clients should know when they're looking to hire a guide and what to look for well i think that what's the value of your time in this state Granted, we're talking bear hunts, so they're OTC. It's a species that's difficult to hunt, has a very steep learning curve. On all of our other species, there's lots of draw hunts. 
some of them take five, 10, 20 plus years to draw. You know, what's the value of your time? What's the value of your experience you've had in the past? And what's what value are you placing on that tag and the overall experience? Um, what I get to do in one season compared to, you know, say the average avid hunter in the state, I'm doing the same amount of stuff in a six month period that they're doing in a six year period. Mm. Uh, so you're, if you're going with someone that's reputable and worth your time and worth your money to go with, uh, it's going to be someone that actually is an expert to some degree on the, on the species. And I use the term expert pretty loosely. Anyone that calls themselves an expert, I have serious doubts that they actually are. Uh, I don't consider myself an expert with bears. I get to hunt bears a lot. I have a lot of bear hunting experience. But every single day that I go out there and hunt them, it's a very humbling experience because when you think you've got it figured out, you have nothing figured out. Mm. You know, if somebody specifically for bear hunting, if, if you're looking into a spawn stock hunt and, and they lay it out as, you know, input A, you get result B, uh, we're going to go out to this spot, we're going to glass this prickly pear face, bear's going to walk out there, and we're going to kill it, and we're going to pack it out. It's like, yeah, theoretically, that's how it's going to work. Um, but we can't predict what the food's going to be like. It takes a massive amount of homework to keep up to speed on what the environment is doing each year, and it changes. Right. It's not the same year. You're not going to find a bear in the same spot every year, rarely. If you do, it's an exceptionally good spot. Mm. Um, I think just don't, I, I won't oversell somebody on a bear hunt. They're super physical. Um, if you want to show up and be ultra picky and look for giant, giant bears only, or look for a certain color only, um, I mean, that's okay, but there's no guarantees that you're going to shoot one. Right. And you better be prepared from a physical standpoint to do absolutely anything that it takes. Mm. Granted, we're being selective with what we're harvesting in general, but you might have an opportunity at one solid board during a hunt. It presents you one solid shot opportunity, say on a five day hunt. That's your chance mm-hmm. in many scenarios. And if you don't want to shoot that, you're not feeling a tag. So it, it, if a guy is just going ho on shooting a, you know, book bear or specifically this color bear, we're not the outfit for you because I'm going out and I'm not hunting a specific bear. I'm hunting bears in an entire environment. And if a bear in this spot provides us the right opportunity at that time, that's the bear that we should be taking. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be more selective, go use a different method or go hunt in a different state. You know, to me, these bear hunts are, it's about the adventure of it. It's about the fact that it is so dang challenging so inconsistent so unpredictable like if you don't enjoy that part of it i'm not gonna sell you bear hunt because you're not gonna have any fun (laughs) (laughs) yep so it sounds like you've got a pretty specific client in mind you know you got someone that likes to grind is physically fit can be fluid and also is willing to change and adapt and kind of just be able to roll with whatever situation is put in front of them yeah yeah absolutely and I think a lot of people fall in that category, a wider range than most people would think. Um, you know, we've guided young kids and teenagers and guided uh, mother and daughter before that just totally kicked butt out there mm. and, and went into places that most grown men won't go. And then I've guided some, you know, dudes in there. 60s, uh, pushing 70 years old that are on my tail the whole time walking up a mountain. Uh, <laughs> there's a wide variety of people that fit in that category. 
And then there's also dudes that are in their 20s or in their 30s and have no excuse not to be in that sort of physical shape. And they come out there and they don't see a bear for 18 hours and they're ready to go home because they're not having any fun. They didn't see a bear. They haven't got to shoot it yet. They're impatient. Mm. Um, You've got to have some mental fortitude to go out there and hunt bears. Sure. Some scenarios, you show up, we roll out of camp at 3 a.m., have a long drive into a spot, long hike into a spot, and a bear opportunity occurs and your hunt's open before the sun even came over the mountain range. Tell yourself it's very lucky because it doesn't happen on every bear hunt. (laughs) You never know what's going to happen. If you aren't prepared for it it mentally, I I can deal with more from a physical standpoint. Now, a a guy doesn't have to be fast going up the hill, but he has to be able to get there Mm -hmm. at some point in the day. (laughs) You know, there there are some limitations there, but... uh, most importantly, I want to know where a guy's head's at and why is he out there trying to do this hunt? And is he going to have an enjoyable experience? Because if I don't think somebody's going to have fun and actually enjoy what we're doing, I'll tell them flat out. Mm-hmm. I don't care if they're going to hunt with me. If, if it's not worth their time and their money, it's not worth my time and effort. Yep. You go there and do it. Absolutely. And you may have already just answered this question right there, but what what are a few things that you wish people uh, knew about guides or, or working with guides? Well, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about guides and guided hunts and every place the guiding environment, outfitting environment is very unique. Arizona is its own example. There are dramatic differences between Utah and Colorado, New Mexico, and, you know, you take a place, they're all different. Um, I think there's some misconception that because you paid for a hunt, you're guaranteed an animal. Um, some people might sell hunts that way. I think those people are crazy or it's not actually hunting. If I can have you come out and shoot something a hundred percent guaranteed, at least for the stuff I enjoy doing, that's not very fun. I I want some degree that we might not be able to do it Mm -hmm. because that's the challenging fun part. Um, Just because you paid for a bear hunt or an elk hunt, particularly if you add restrictions to that or you, and size goals to that or physical limitations to that like expect your chances of killing something to go down and particularly expect your chances of killing what you're seeking to kill to go down like you may settle for something different based on circumstance and you got to be okay with that Mm -hmm. or be okay with not feeling a tag that's perfectly okay too you know there's guys that come out and they have a certain goal in mind and they've got the experience and the patience and, and the knowledge to back it up and be picky. And they're, they are looking for a certain experience. And if that doesn't occur, they don't pull the trigger and that's totally fine. Uh, but just because you pay for something doesn't, doesn't mean you can come out and kill an animal. It's not with us. Right. If, and if you do kill an animal, I, I can absolutely guarantee that whether it's a 60 second long hunt or you know, a 14 day hunt, you're going to earn that animal. Um, some people I think have this misconception of people that book hunts are going out with guides and they show up and they pull the trigger and kill an animal and the guy does all the work and the client shouldn't get any credit for it. Stuff like that. That's not the case at all. Like our clients work equally as hard. My buddies coming out to help work equally as hard. Like, there's a ton of effort and a ton of credit due to lots of people to put animals on the ground. And just because you pay for a hunt doesn't make you any less deserving of taking that animal either. Mm. Absolutely. How many uh, clients are you guys typically guiding over the course of like a bear season from spring to fall? Um, it totally depends on the year. And to be honest, bear hunts are hard to sell. And 
particularly how I want to sell them because I want to sell them to everybody. <laughs> I want to sell them to the right type of people that a bear hunt's going to be what they're going to value. If, if, if you're not, if I don't think you're going to get the value out of it, they'll come through the hunt. So it, it's pretty limited. You know, some years it's, it's been one, two, three people. Um, this year we've got about eight, um, just for the fall. Um, it just varies. Uh, there's a lot of fluctuations in it with it being an over the counter hunt. Um, you know, that's going to be more limited in the future. Only having basically March, April, and then August, October to hunt primarily. Previously, we had basically from March through October. Mm-hmm. But there was some melting. Uh, but with the with the loss of the May, June, and July seasons, that, of course, limits what we can do. And I think it's a big, huge mistake from my standpoint on where the seasons are being moved to. But I don't control that. So Sure. Yeah, no, I agree. I was interested that popped you were one of the first people with this because we were planning this episode when those changes rolled out and that you were one of the first people that popped in my head I was like man I bet he's got great insight on that (laughs) on what the effects of the changes are and and whether or not it was a mistake or you know what insight there was into that I on my end it's just a I, I think their logic for the changes is off base and, and I don't buy it. Um, basically there's been an increase in female take during the spring because this is what they're saying. Some of the data shows this. Um, well, we back up. I haven't seen any bear data for Arizona that's been published and put out there. Um, that's current beyond uh, 2016. Uh, so bears have been mandatory reported for a long time. They're one of the most studied animals that we have. Um, there's records going back to at least 1964. You can look it all up on the website. Wow. And I believe 1980 was the year that the current check-in procedures went into effect. Um, so everything like 1980 current has been done exactly the same. And for whatever reason, uh, I know some of it, but they haven't put out any data since 2016. Hmm. So how are they supposed to then go verify some of these trends that are going on? Um, what's interesting to be able to look back in that data is, you know, go look at whether, go compare weather in 80s, 90s, early 2000s, look at that data and look at the ebb and flow and change of harvest rates Mm. and the composition of what's killed in units, whether that be other methods, glassing, calling, sitting water versus hound take and you can go look at the male to female breakdown Um, we don't know what's been going on the last couple of years officially because it's it's not all a part of that data it should be right it's it's not out there Uh, there obviously has been an increase in spring bear on interest (coughs) Um, bear hunt interest in general I'm not sure that that's specific to just bears. It seems like interest in all of hunting has gone up, mm-hmm. particularly since COVID. You, you know, the first couple months after all of the COVID stuff started happening, uh, it didn't matter where you were. The elk woods looked like it was the day before archery season. <laughs> there were camps everywhere. Everybody's out. Everybody's involved. So you have yep. an increase in interest whether that be just population increase in the state, uh, you know, national social interest in, from hunters into bear hunting and hunting multiple states more frequently now, 
or the input of COVID and people being outside because they couldn't do anything else. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people got back into hunting and naturally more bears got killed, particularly in the spring. It's the only thing that's open for some months or was. Yep. Yeah. So the theory is if we push the seasons back and we limit the length of the season, we'll limit the amount of females killed. Well, yeah, that simple premise does make sense. But then their logic to back up the change is where I have the problem. Mm -hmm. Because their justification, they quote a recent New Mexico study, and they also also quote a significant part of uh, one of LeCount's studies out of Four Peaks. It was done in the 80s, uh, or done in the 70s. I think it was published in 80. And the theory is boars, mature boars, emerge from their dens first and earliest. And younger bears and females without cubs would emerge second. And then it's, this is all pretty logical, too. Uh, females with cubs are going to emerge from their den last latest in the spring well it's pretty straightforward cubs aren't very mobile so they've got to get big enough first before they can actually leave it inside and the idea of emergence is the hiccup i have with their their logic there because emergence the way i have read multiple studies on bears and what i've observed personally that just is their seasonal seasonal abandonment of that in area. A bear doesn't go into some hole in the ground or a rock pile or a tree stump in November and lay down and go to sleep until March. That's not how it works. Sometimes they have multiple den sites in close proximity. They're, they're usually have den sites that are close to food, close to water. If weather conditions and food are plentiful, they might not move around a ton, but they'll still come out still go to water they might feed a little bit and even the LeCount study that they quoted as part of their justification references other studies that talk about bears that don't den at all and are active all through that season regardless of when females with cubs come out of their den officially they're and leave their den for the season, they still come out. They still are visible. You can still find them. I think the first year, the first year I actually spring bear hunted would have been 2014. And that was the first year that I saw a sow with cubs in the spring. Not early in the spring. This would have been very early April. I've seen them active in early March, uh, cubs roaming around. The thing is, when they're that small, that time of year, and they're that lethargic, it takes so much more time to identify whether that bear has cubs with it. So part of their justification was, let's push the hunt backs back because there's been some public pressure from anti-hunting groups and stuff about spring seasons being unethical and your hunting bears coming out right out of the den and they can't get away and you know whatever bs and a, and a hundred people want to come up with it's emotionally based and whatever fantasy land they live in <laughs> <clears throat> there's this like theoretical orphan cub scenario with spring bear hunting that hunters go out there and they shoot the first bear they see and they don't know it's got cubs mm-hmm. and they open these cubs, which theoretically that could happen. Personally, I don't know if it happened in Arizona. If it were going to happen, I would say it would happen in the earliest months when they're hardest to see and they're least active. And you have a female come out of a den site and stand there in a glass bowl location. Because now with the season changes, if somebody wants to go hunt the spring, they no longer have the option to wait till May, June, or July to go out when bears are more active and look at multiple bears and get picky. Now, say they go out opening week in March, 
They don't see anything. They come back a month later, and it's still slow. From a you know a hunter mindset standpoint, a lot of people are just going to then shoot the first bear they see and not do their due diligence. I hope it doesn't happen. But when it does, it's on game fish for their twisted logic of why to push back seasons. Mm. Just because a bear quit using their den at a certain time frame doesn't mean that we can't go find them. Mm-hmm. I don't care what month it is. We can go find bears. They're still there. They still move around. We don't have 27 feet of snow keeping them in the ground. So it it kind of sucks because I think that actually from what I've got to observe over the years that some of those summer hunts when conditions were tough early and, and spring hunts didn't get shut down. Some of these hunts went like 80 plus days um, and it went into June and July, mm. which are basically the same conditions we have on the August hunt. Mm-hmm. But nobody was out there and you would get to hunt them and watch a lot of bears like through that breeding period. So you would get to see a mature boar standing next to a sow and get the direct comparison. <laughs> no other time of the year do you usually see that. You might see them on the same hillside, but it's usually not at the same time. Mm. You know, uh, what better comparison could you have to make a good selection on what to shoot than have a male standing next to a female? Right. And get to know the differences. Right. And observe the behavior, direct comparison in real time. Yep. Yep. That would have been the best opportunity for sure. And the most amount of education gained too, to see those two standing next to each other. <clears throat> but uh, the overall premise is going to work. It's, it's, they're going to kill less bears in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> those people are just going to shoot them in the fall. If yep. they're still bear hunting or it's going to push more interest earlier and actually put them at more risk. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it was definitely unfortunate to see those taken away. And uh, I think it's only a sign of more things to come, too, unfortunately. I I don't know. I, I'm not doomsday scenario on the changes. Yeah, I hope uh, not. I'm trying to keep a positive outlook on it as well, but I just... I their seasons really... have changed a lot. You know, it was, it's only been, I think, in the last five years that they started lengthening those OTC hunts into July. Um, granted, we've had draw tags going back for it, as long as I could find regs for. There were draw seasons um, for archery that ran through the summer. Uh, you got to go back to, like, early, mid-2000s to have... Uh, no OTC tags. Uh, not sure of the exact year, but it it's not been static. It, you know, seasons constantly have changed. The female harvest objectives have changed. Mm. Um, it's going to change every five years. It's change again in five years. Sure. Yep. Hopefully, they've got better information, better data, and hopefully, they get better information from bear hunters and actually listen to them. Mm-hmm. And I hope that they do their job and actually evaluating data and making common sense assessments on stuff and not allowing politics and social pressure and things like that to get into it because the bears don't benefit if they do. Right. right. Nor Nor does any other wildlife. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, if someone's looking to slap that title bear hunter onto their, uh, their hunting resume uh, what does it cost to do a, a fully outfitted black bear hunt with you so that is all we offer our five day fully outfitted bear hunts they're four thousand they're all one-on-one we no two-on-one stuff because the physical requirements on it um sometimes we have multiple hunters come but that always means there's one guide for one hunter um and i've been asked a lot too if you don't know, do you do guide only stuff and I used to, and it was always way more trouble and limited us on where we could go. 
uh, because conditions might dictate that I can set up a regular camp that we can get a 40 foot trailer into, or they might dictate that we have to throw a camp in the back of a side by side and drive 27 miles to set it up mm. and you can't get your motor home there. So, <laughs> you know, camps where I set up camp based on those conditions and if it's fully outfitted, we can control a lot of stuff. Also the food side of it on a fully outfitted hunt. Um, you know, being out in August in Arizona, there's a lot of daylight. Yep. And when you've got travel to and from spot, hikes in and out of a spot, uh, we're usually back in camp, 9, 30, 10 o'clock. You don't want to spend an hour making a meal and go to sleep 11, 11, 30, and then wake up again at 3 and do it again. So we have pretty dialed in system as, as far as how we prep all of our food and still be able to have home cooked meals and quality food, especially when you're running that amount of time and at that level, uh, you need good food, you need good fuel for your body. Uh, it goes a long ways to, to prepare in that manner and have things be efficient and then be able to get to sleep on top of it where we can come back, we can have food ready in 10 to 30 minutes and crawl in bed and, and wake up and hit the ground running in the morning and be as efficient as possible. Um, basically, if, if anybody's interested in doing it, you can check out our website, chasingtheking.com. There's lots of bear hunt information on the species page and I'm updating the actual like OTC bear hunt page, but most of all of that stuff is on the, on the, the species specific page for black bear. Um, and give me a call if it's, if it even sounds interesting. Um, if you, if you don't like a challenge, if you don't like pushing yourself to the limits, if you don't like hard work, probably not to hunt for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, My okay. theory is that if I can talk you out of a bear hunt, it's not the kind of hunt that I want to sell to you. If I can tell you all the crazy experiences and crazy places that we go and the stuff that might occur and you need to be prepared for and all of the requirements. And at the end of that, you're still excited about the idea. You're going to have a freaking blast. <laughs> it sounds like a blast to me, man. I'm that kind of person. If it's a grind, like I'm down for it. <laughs> You got to enjoy the suck. Yep, exactly. <laughs> What's your Instagram you handle too, bud? Kill one, do it some other way. <laughs> do it some other place. That's a different game. It might be the same species, but it's a totally different experience. Yeah. Yep. What's your uh, Instagram handle as well so people can go follow you there and check out some of the content that you post? Because you've got some pretty cool stuff on there. You can find me at Chase and the King on Instagram, and same thing on Facebook. That's Chase, the letter N, the King. And that has, there's links to our website and web pages and all that stuff on there, too. And you can check out some of our on films and things like that on the website as well. There's lots of information, and I'm trying to continually update it and keep people up to speed as much as possible and hopefully continue to do lots more stuff here in Arizona for bears. Um, I think this is, this is year 13 that I've been bear hunting and we're just getting started. Heck yeah, man. Well, I'm super grateful for you giving me your time. I know it's probably pretty short, <laughs> not as not as available these days. Um, so thank you for spending this, you know, almost hour and a half with me here and uh, just dropping some major knowledge and giving some really good insight too, man. I know I definitely walked away learning quite a few things on this episode. So super grateful for you to to give us the advice and all the insight that you've gathered over the years, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. I, uh, we would have done this sooner, but I was actually busy chasing bears. There you go. <laughs> I, didn't have the <laughs> um, I mean, that, that's the thing. I get quite a few questions from people that are serious bear hunters, and 
and from people interested in bear hunts too. And, and obviously I've, I've got to do quite a bit and experience quite a bit, but not, a lot of it, it, they're my opinions on things and, and that's always changing. That's always evolving. There's always new stuff. Uh, like I said before, that's, that's part of what makes it my favorite hunt is it, you never know what's going to happen. That's that that what if factor, mm-hmm. and that the unknown is, is what really has made it the most interesting thing to hunt, in my opinion. And the fact that not everybody gets to shoot a bear in Arizona, right? It, yep. It's a significant achievement whether you shoot a young bear or a sow or a big giant bear. Any tag filled on a bear is a significant achievement, and there's you, you start trying to add in the actually being selective and and being conscious of what choice you're making when you're pulling that trigger out there and it's just it's it's the right direction to go with it i hope more people start going that direction too and there certainly are lots of them um, but it means that you don't always get to shoot one <laughs> right <laughs> you gotta be okay with that yep you do definitely well thank you again buddy i appreciate it and uh, appreciate you coming on to the podcast and hopefully we'll get you on again soon man absolutely thanks for having me steven all right buddy thank you so much absolutely take care have a good one. thank you so much for listening to the bow hunting az podcast don't forget to follow us on instagram facebook and YouTube at at bonehuntingaz. If you would, please smash those five stars for us on iTunes and leave us a little review. It'll really help us out. Good luck on your next hunt. We'll catch you in the next episode. See ya.